us to session four that gathers uh, experts that will talk about the enabling technologies that are paving the way towards uh, 6G. And the first intervention is, is from Nicolas Schubert from Thales. And his presentation, his talk will focus on non-terrestrial network standards and next steps. Nicolas, are you with us? Yes, you are, I can see you. You're, you're muted, Nicola. We can see your slide. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, great. Voila. So, great. Um, so we can hear you. If you want to pass on, uh, voila. Great. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Nicola. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. So, I'm going to talk about uh, one uh, the non terrestrial network uh, technology and the standard, which has uh, uh, the first version of it has been uh, uh, made available uh, in June uh, this year. And uh, we'll talk also about the, the future, uh, the next possible next steps. So uh, first of all, uh, this is the overall vision that at least in Thales we have uh, pursued uh, in 3 um, With starting point is that uh, previously um, the satellite network were independently designed from the terrestrial network. There was some connectivity between both uh, in order to provide, uh, for instance, uh, backhaul uh, services, but the, these are loose interactions and it was uh, not, uh, uh, not certainly not uh, uh, integrated in order to provide a, a, a given service to to user uh, to end users. Uh, with the um, in the five G, what we have tried is to add a satellite component to the existing, uh, I mean, to the defined five uh, G system. So uh, this is this is what uh, the NTN standard enabled, and we uh, consider that uh, as part of the 6G, uh, the uh, uh, an architecture could um, be defined to natively support both uh, terrestrial and satellite network components to address a set of common goals like, uh, for instance, uh, coverage, uh, resiliency but also um, uh, sustainability uh, overall uh, goals. Um, but that I will talk uh, later on. So having uh, set the scene on the, this uh, adventure, um, here we, we are going to talk about the, the standard which has been uh, released and which uh, enables uh, three kinds of uh, integration. Well. The first is uh, related to backhaul. We have been working on features uh, to be able to um, mitigate the specific of a satellite transport network, which is a, a, a long latency uh, pipe and uh, whatever technology uh, is being used in the satellite network. Uh, still, it's, um, it's a long uh, latency pipe and uh, we need to review some features like especially the QS management and so on, and that was defined. Um, another uh, scenario is to, uh, and which is very disruptive, which is to uh, provide a direct connectivity between the satellite and, uh, and user devices. And we can distinguish between the IoT devices and the smartphone uh, devices. Um, the third uh, scenario that uh, we were, uh, we're going to introduce is uh, related to the leveraging of this integrated access and backhaul so that a satellite access, a 5G satellite access network would uh, be able to, 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 to support access, but also backhaul to um, uh, um, a local and remote uh, access point, which is uh, 5G. So in, in this uh, third uh, scenario, actually the, um, uh, there is going to be a continuum of uh, uh, 5G technology used 
uh, throughout uh, the local, but also the um, satellite access network, enabling uh, a best management of QS security, uh, as well as performance, uh, which um, to overcome the, uh, the hurdles associated to the legacy satellite backhaul where both uh, the satellite network, satellite transport network and the mobile systems are uh, not uh, uh, well uh, combined. That there is no, for instance, no uh, integration in the radio resource management uh, between both uh, systems. So these are different uh, options for uh, what NTN uh, enables. Uh, as I hinted, there are three types of satellite networks being considered in 3GPP now. Um, the first is to address direct connectivity to IoT devices based on the narrowband IoT and EMTC radio interface, which is 4G. The other one is the smartphone connectivity uh, using 5G new radio. Both uh, type of scenarios consider um, a frequency band below 7 gigahertz, uh, which is uh, quite suitable for uh, omnidirectional antenna. Whereas the uh, uh, several, uh, up to several hundreds of uh, kilobits per second could be um, achieved uh, on the first scenario, uh, wideband service, that means few megabits per second, uh, could be achieved uh, with direct connectivity to, to smartphones. Well, obviously, if you are able to address uh, uh, smartphones, you can also address uh, car or drone mounted devices, maybe with a higher performance, provided that you get a, a, a better terminal performance in terms of RF. In the release 18, we are currently working on the, um, uh, the, the indirect connectivity that uh, I mentioned about, uh, so that, uh, for instance, you would have a satellite network uh, um, providing connectivity to a VSAT uh, using the 5G new radio operating in above 10 gigahertz. And this VSAT could be uh, connected to uh, a, a local and remote uh, uh, access point. Um, and there, uh, the uh, satellite network could provide up to uh, 100 of megabits per second um, per, per, uh, per terminals. So we, we see that the 3GPP technology uh, is, uh, can be applicable to all uh, uh, satellite networks, uh, whatever frequency band, orbit, uh, uh, devices, uh, or services. What we introduced in the NTN standard is features um, uh, that uh, in the 5G system, so that the 5G system can accommodate uh, uh, the uh, technical issues or the specifics associated to non-terrestrial network, which are compared to a mobile network, an extended and variable uh, uh, propagation delay, uh, as well as Doppler. We have um, wider and possibly moving radio cells uh, to, to deal with. Uh, we have, um, a new challenge, which is the service continuity between uh, terrestrial network and non-terrestrial network. Uh, whereas terrestrial network to NTN could be uh, simple, it means if you don't have any more service on the terrestrial network, you could uh, the, you, 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 you will uh, definitely look for other access network among which the non-terrestrial network. Whereas on the opposite direction, uh, it may be a bit more tricky because there could be an overlap in terms of coverage uh, between the non-terrestrial network and terrestrial network in the, uh, especially for instance, suburban areas. So you may need to invent new uh, schemes uh, to trigger the 
uh, handover or I mean the mobility between the non-terrestrial network to the terrestrial one at the right moment. Um, of course, uh, the spectrum usage uh, may uh, be different uh, compared to uh, mobile systems. And this uh, is uh, something that mean, uh, needs to be uh, addressed, especially uh, the coexistence uh, between a, a terrestrial and a non-terrestrial network at the, uh, in two adjacent uh, bands. And uh, another issue to address is to, well, this is the same in terrestrial network, but, but it has a, a, a specific context in NTN due to the fact that um, uh, the, the beams, I mean, the radio cells in, in NTN could, could be large and could be covering uh, multiple countries. You may have to develop some some features to, to reliably uh, locate the UE so that it can be attached to the right uh, um, service center in, in the right country. Um, we have considered uh, in both release 17 and 18 the, the, that UE will, equipped, will be equipped with GNSS capabilities to ease the uplink uh, synchronization. These are all the um, uh, features uh, that we have uh, uh, introduced uh, in the 5G uh, standard in order to support NTN. Uh, there are features at different uh, level, uh, physical access layer, layer, architecture, and so on. Um, the, what is e important is um, to, to say that uh, most of these features are, are software, um, uh, they are probably going to be implemented in software uh, at the user equipment, uh, but some of them uh, may require some uh, hardware update, especially if you're uh, addressing new bands, obviously, you need to revise the, the RF front end. Um, but the Possibly also at the physical layer, there could be some firmware uh, update in order to support the uplink and uh, time and frequency synchronization enhancement to accommodate the Doppler and, and the latency. Um, uh, as you see, there are also other in impacts uh, at the access layer, for instance, at the Mac uh, in, in the hybrid AARQ, for instance, that, yeah, that you may consider to deactivate, uh, especially if you have a, a geostationary satellite network with a long latency. Whereas in a, a low Earth orbiting satellite network, you may still use the HARQ, but with a different uh, configuration. You may have some impact uh, timers uh, at the network in order to accommodate the, the, the the, the extended uh, latency, you, uh, you have uh, something which is quite uh, uh, new compared to, to mobile network is that uh, a feeder link, uh, a satellite is always attached to a gateway. Um, and uh, so when, when uh, you have um, a non-geostationary orbiting uh, a satellite, it will move, uh, it will be constantly in motion around the earth and then it has to be always attached to a, a, a new gateway. So it will uh, hop from one gateway to another. So the, uh, we, we need to develop uh, a feature called fiddle, fiddling switchover. Um, so here are uh, this list of uh, features that have been uh, developed, uh, uh, defined, sorry. And um, uh, now, what are the key benefits of this NTN standard? Uh, why shouldn't uh, the satellite uh, uh, community not to continue with this uh, proprietary uh, uh, technology? Well, the, the fact is uh, uh, the, the, the users of a satellite network are calling for a, a, a true standard uh, because they are interested in this multi-vendor interoperability. And, and in this way, they can uh, be, uh, uh, they can escape from this vendor lock or system lock 
uh, in, in, uh, which uh, they are currently encountering with uh, uh, existing uh, uh, satellite networks. Another point is that uh, this NTN uh, standard uh, can enable this uh, better integration of satellite, uh, obviously in the global 3GPP ecosystem and possibly uh, um, enabling access to a wider set of uh, vendors uh, at all level and leveraging the economy of scale of 3GPP to drive down the cost of especially the terminal part, but not other parts as well. Um, other part in, in the network infrastructure. It can also combine, uh, support the combination with uh, a, a terrestrial access to offer the service continuity, for instance, uh, and possibly the reliability, uh, better reliability through multi-connectivity. Also, it can uh, support the combination of uh, a multiple satellite access network uh, for instance, uh, a non-geo and uh, geo uh, to mitigate the uh, long latency of uh, the GSO while benefiting of the higher, possibly higher throughput of, uh, uh, um, of GSO in a given area. And obviously, NTN standard would uh, natively uh, support advanced 5G features in, in a better way than any proprietary uh, uh, network technology would do. Um, so, so we believe that this uh, standardization activity in NTN will pave the way for future uh, enhancements in these uh, uh, 3GPP defined satellite networks. Uh, and, and indeed, the satellite community is looking at introducing uh, further enhancements uh, for beyond 5G and, and obviously 6G. So to, uh, to, to, ex to consider new use cases, as we will uh, see later. Um, here is a slide which um, is... Uh, um, ju just to clarify uh, uh, different satellite network solutions uh, that are considered for 5G. So we have talked about the forge, uh, the backhaul, which could be any kind of uh, satellite transport. This is, we'd say, the legacy use case of satellite in, in, in mobile systems. Um, that, that will obviously pertain. Uh, the next one is uh, a, a more disruption is uh, to be able to serve uh, 3GPP defined uh, smartphones. Uh, the second, uh, the third one is to be able to serve uh, directly uh, 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 3GPP defined IoT devices. And, um, and then there is another category that some satellite players are putting forward uh, where they're saying, well, we, we we have a, a legacy satellite access network that is targeting our proprietary defined terminals, and we would like to connect it to a, a 5G core. So, uh, so the, it means that somehow you can provide 5G kind of service to uh, your uh, proprietary uh, set of uh, terminals. Uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the, the roadmap, a possible roadmap. Well, obviously in the release 17 and release 18, uh, things are um, have been uh, um, are ongoing. Well, 17 is, is completed, but release 18 is ongoing. So in 17, we have worked on the backhaul with uh, static bandwidth and uh, static latency. In, uh, uh, we have worked on the satellite connectivity to smartphones operating in sub six gigahertz, uh, connectivity to IoT devices also in sub six gigahertz. In release 18, we are working on the backhaul with variable bandwidth and latency, especially backhaul through a constellation of satellite interconnected to one another. And this, um, inter-satellite link uh, network will, uh, will uh, uh, present some uh, uh, variable bandwidth and latency and maybe uh, the 5G system should 
implement some features to accommodate the, this, uh, uh, this specifics. Uh, this is currently being discussed. Um, in, for, for the smartphone connectivity, we are introducing a, a, a network verified U location, so to reliably uh, being able to locate a UE. We are uh, working on enhancement of coverage in order to gain a few dB on the link budget and um, uh, um, uh, new mobility to ease the mobility uh, in various uh, scenarios. Uh, on the IoT, uh, we are working especially on the discontinuous coverage. It means that you could deploy just a single satellite with a, uh, um, that <clears throat> would uh, provide intermittent coverage uh, over a given area because it's it's providing coverage at a certain point. Then it moves around the Earth. Uh, and then uh, eventually <laughs> will uh, uh, serve again the same area. And so we need to uh, uh, implement some features at terminal level so that uh, it, the terminal will not looking constantly at the signal because the signal is not there for <laughs> a certain amount of time. So um, in order to save battery, uh, we, we need to, to do some enhancement. And we are introducing uh, the deployment of NR in uh, 10 gigahertz, above uh, 10 gigahertz bands. Uh, so uh, to support the connectivity to VSAT means the in, indirect uh, connectivity scenarios I was referring to uh, previously. In the release 19, uh, the satellite community hope to introduce uh, regenerative payload scenarios uh, and other uh, uh, features like the integrated access uh, and backhaul. And uh, then uh, the 6G will start first uh, with uh, service requirements, then a study, and then uh, a normative phase in uh, 2026. So uh, we'll work on that. Now let's talk about uh, 6G a little bit. So this, you know very well, it has been presented uh, many times. So when you see all these performance, very, very challenging to achieve with a satellite network. So, so everybody will say, well, what, what are you going to do there? Well, what's going to be the, the role of a satellite in this, uh, in this context? Well, still, um, there are some uh, key, uh, um, uh, key uh, uh, features that to which the satellite can contribute. Of course, it's going to be humble contribution uh, compared to the uh, one gigabits per second uh, achievement uh, on the terrestrial side. But still, coverage, uh, if you want to have global coverage, uh, maybe people would be happy with uh, less than one gigabits per second. Well, still more than the uh, what was uh, uh, previously offered in, in 5G, but uh, with much less than terrestrial network. So that's uh, something that uh, that's going to be the role of satellite: do less than terrestrial, but with uh, longer, larger coverage. Resiliency is another point where. Uh, could be that terrestrial network is uh, down and it could be nice to have uh, a possibility to uh, as backup and um, and that that's a role a satellite can play of course it's uh, intermittent um, and uh, there could be um, other um, other aspect to which the satellite can contribute for instance sustainability um, thanks to uh, uh, solar uh, fueled uh, uh, satellite systems. Um, and uh, uh, also to context aware where with uh, future satellite network could provide also um, the um, lo location and sensing capabilities um, just as terrestrial networks. So we will um, 
uh, focus as part of the 6G in uh, four different axes. First, we will consider to introduce a capability of ultra reliable low latency communication. Uh, the second, uh, with the possibility to uh, support GNSS free operation in terms of capability. We will obviously work on the performance uh, band bandwidth, better coverage means better link budget, um, and also uh, work on, on the footprint to uh, uh, at uh, two uh, level uh, energy and spectrum. And that's going to be for the benefit of all these uh, uh, verticals. Obviously, it will also benefit to the consumers, but especially uh, to the verticals, which may be less uh, addressed in uh, the um, um, uh, in, in in the especially in the five G, where we have uh, remember we have been working very much to address mass market IoT devices and smartphones. And uh, maybe we can do more for the verticals uh, to, to, to better address uh, uh, them in the 6G. Of course, they can be addressed with 5G, but we can maybe do more. Um, I am completely lost in terms of uh, time. <laughs> So I don't know if I still have time, but- uh, um, Two minutes to conclude, Nicola. Yes. Thank so you. I've uh, actually presented these views um, on uh, what could be, uh, what is the NTN and what could be uh, the, the future of NTN for the future of uh, uh, satellite networks. And uh, well, it has been prepared as part of an ESA uh, eager project. Um, and if you are interested uh, in further details, you can uh, contact me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nicola. Um, if you don't mind, there is a question from you, uh, for you from the audience. Uh, that is about um, integrated sensing in satellite networks. Uh, what is the status there and what would be, I mean, there would be many interesting applications for radio sensing from LEO orbit. Can you comment on that, Nicola? Yeah, I, 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 I fully support that, I, indeed. Um, uh, this is something that uh, we haven't, I mean, in the community, uh, we have uh, less worked uh, on, on that. But definitely, uh, this is something to be considered in the, in the satellite uh, network environment. Probably uh, the use case targeted will be different because the resolution may be a little bit different since uh, 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 satellite objects are flying uh, at much uh, with, with higher range than the uh, terrestrial uh, network. But uh, definitely, there could be uh, a, a, an interest, and uh, uh, there are some going to be some research uh, going to start uh, uh, soon, as far as I know. Maybe, Thank you, Nicola. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, whoever else wants to add any information, also from the audience, and uh, has input on the discussions, please feel free to share links and pointers uh, via the chat. Okay, uh, Nicola, thanks a lot again once more for your intervention. And now uh, I would pass to the next speaker, that is um, Professor Geoffrey Lee from Imperial College in London, um, that will focus on conventional, the, the, the shift from conventional to semantic communications based on deep learning. Um, Professor Lee, are you online? Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Great. We can hear well, we can see the slides not yet in uh, slide mode. Yes, that's okay. perfect. Thank you, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, uh, good morning or afternoon everybody. Uh, this is Jeffrey Lee uh, from Imperial College in London. The talk today is about uh, from uh, conventional to semantic communications based on deep learning. This is the uh, outline of my talk. First, I will provide a very br brief overview uh, what is the uh, conventional communication, what is the semantic communication. 
Then we talk about the several techniques uh, uh, for conventional communications and for semantic communications. Those techniques are based on deep learning. Then I will conclude my talk. Well, back to about uh, six or seven years ago when we started to uh, introduce machine learning for communications, we uh, figured out what's the uh, advantage and disadvantage of the uh, traditional way of design communication systems. And, uh, and then we decided to use machine learning to improve the performance of uh, uh, conventional communication systems. And also we are trying to use the uh, uh, deep learning uh, to develop or implement uh, semantic communications, which semantic communication is itself is an old concept, but uh, it cannot be implemented until recently because it can be only possible based on uh, deep learning. Well, let's talk about uh, the design of the conventional communication systems. Okay, in the traditional design of conventional communication systems, usually we have uh, divided the the whole transmitter and the receiver into uh, different blocks. For example, at the transmitter, we have error crash encoding. Uh, at the receiver, we have uh, decoding, right? And we have to do things inversely. And we have a modulation at the transmitter. We have uh, demodulation at the receiver. And of course, we need to do timing, channel estimation, and so on at the receiver. But anyway, each block or each pair of blocks are designed based on different uh, performance metrics. For example, when we design error correction coding and decoding, we focused on the bit error rate or block error rate. However, when we design modulation, demodulation, and the channel estimation, Perhaps we use the minimum mean square, minimum mean square error as a performance metric. Because of different performance metrics for different block designs, it's hard to perform joint optimization to the whole transceiver. And with machine learning, we can develop end-to-end -end communication systems and to perform a joint transceiver design. Of course, we can use the machine learning to improve the performance of each individual block in a traditional block-based uh, design. For example, we can use the neural networks to improve performance of channel estimation or improve the performance of the uh, signal detection. So in general, you will look at the, uh, the this figure, and uh, we can easily see the uh, we can easily see the uh, we have may have the traditional block block structured, and we can also design the system based on the data driven and uh, data driven machine learning. And inside of the data driven, we have a special case, which is the end to end communication systems. And as we see in the previous slides, we use the neural network to, to represent the whole transmitter, another one to represent the whole receiver. And inside the block structure, we have something called a model driven, which combines the traditional knowledge in communication domain uh, with the uh, deep learning to improve the performance. Of course, we can also have a data-driven block structure and uh, which use the uh, a neural network or use the machine learning to improve the performance of the physical layer communication systems. And for details, you can take a look at our, uh, uh, this, uh, those uh, uh, survey papers uh, on these slides. Okay. Before we talked about the conventional communication system design, and uh, we talked about the traditional design and the machine learning based design. And uh, there can be a traditional co conventional communication systems focus on transmitting symbols 
or transmitter bits. And uh, while ignoring the meaning of the bits or, or symbol sequences. That is to say, when we design a communication system, we just regard the, the communication, the system as a pipe to transmit the symbols or to transmit the binary dates. And we don't care what's the meaning of the those symbols and we don't care what's the purpose to transmit it and we only care about uh, at the receiver we accurately recover these transmitted symbol or binary dates so that's a conventional communication and all sometimes we also call the uh, communication in shannon paradigm and actually, the concept of semantic communication is not new. It appeared about 70 years ago. When Shannon and Weaver uh, write the, wrote their masterpiece, Mathematical Theory of Communication, they divided the communication into three levels. The first level is the transmission of symbols, which is what we, we do every day, and uh, which is called a Shannon paradigm. And for those systems, we just uh, act, try to accurately transmit and recover the symbols, symbol sequences or binary data, and which uh, uh, follows a Shannon uh, limit. And uh, it's already well developed nowadays. And then there are other two levels of communication. One is the semantic exchange of source information, and which is called uh, uh, like uh, semantic communication. That is to say, we're not only focused on the transmitting uh, symbols, we, are, we focus on the, the transmitter, the meaning of the content. And also we have the third level, which is the effects of the semantic uh, information exchange. Nowadays, we call both the second level, uh, semantic exchange of source, source information, and the effects of semantic information, we call those two levels as a semantic communication. So the critical characteristic of the semantic communication, for example, if I transmit, a, I have an automobile through a semantic communication system, the recovered sentence could be I own a car. Those two sentences, the transmitted one and the received one, are with the same uh, uh, meaning but they are expressed differently. And if we use a conventional communication system, the recovered sentence could be, I have an automobile, the same as the transmitted one. Or could it be the, there are some mistakes on, on some uh, letters or some locations, uh, but uh, uh, we can't, that's a critical difference between the conventional and the semantic communication. So you we look at the conventional communication systems, for example, as in this figure. You will want to transmit an image in text or speech or whatever. The first thing for us to do is to convert the source content into bits, bit sequences or symbol sequences. And then we go through channel coding and also modulation, demodulation, and so on. At the receiver, we have channel decoding. Of course, we have the demodulation, we have whatever. And uh, we're trying to recover the transmitted bits accurately. And from recovered bits or bit sequences, and uh, we're trying to use source decoding to convert the transmitted content back to original image, text, or speech. This is the conventional communication. So as for what's the meaning of this image or what's the meaning of the text and uh, our human being look at the text uh, or listen to the speech uh, or watch on the uh, image, we can figure out what's the meaning inside those uh, transmitted content. This is the conventional communication. As I said, one of the critical issues is when we process those uh, transmitted content, we only regarded them as a symbol sequence or bit sequence. 
regardless of the meaning inside uh, this transmitted content. So while for semantic communication, the first thing, first thing for us to do is from the transmitted content, which could be image in text or speech, we first do feature coding or feature extraction. And through the expected feature, and then we, we transmit to the expected feature to the channel and to the receiver, we are trying to recover the transmitted feature and then take the action according to the semantic meaning of the transmitted content. That's a critical difference. So for the semantic communication, first thing for us to do is to extract the feature or extract the semantic meaning of the transmitted contents and then transmit the semantic meaning. That's why it is called a semantic communication. So another issue is because extract the semantic meaning from the transmitted content is, a, is not that easy. There is no uh, mathematical model to tackle this issue. Therefore, in the past so many years, maybe 60 years, even though we have the concept of the semantic communication, but the impl implementation of semantic communication is impossible. With deep learning, especially with deep neural networks, it's easy for us and uh, to extract uh, the semantic meaning of the transmitted contents from the uh, from the source. That's why most of the semantic communications are based on the deep learning. So let's give uh, several examples to demonstrate how can deep learning use in conventional and semantic communications. So, so one of the, this is actually, we have already shown this figure before, and uh, we can divide it as a uh, conventional communication systems into lots of blocks at the transmitter and the receiver. Then we use machine learning to improve the performance of each, in, each individual block. One of the example is, uh, and you will look at the, this figure, it's uh, like, a, uh, like a OFDM system, a very simple one. And uh, about uh, over 25 years ago, we, I developed a channel estimation for OFDM system, which this paper has already turns to be the classic paper in the area. But anyway, let's look at, to take a look at the receiver. At the receiver, we have two blocks. One is channel estimation, another one is data, uh, uh, data detection or recovered data. And one of the important issues is the, uh, and uh, back to 25 years ago, I estimate a channel based on the traditional signal processing approach. And then based on the signal uh, channel, estimated channel, I do uh, recover the channel, recover the transmitted symbol. That's what we have done 25 years ago. And uh, nowadays, we do that in different. And uh, we can combine the channel estimation and the signal detection into one neural network, as we can see in this figure. Here, the input is a symbol consists of two parts. The first part is received a pilot uh, symbols, and the second part is received the data. Of course, it moves up for either pilots or data are both uh, with distortion, channel distortion. And uh, the neural network try to uh, interpret or implicitly estimate the channels based on the received pilot, and then use the received use the uh, estimated channel together with the received data. We can recover the transmitted data. So in this neural network, the output is just a recovered data. For the detail, you can take a look at this, uh, this paper published uh, several years ago. And uh, another big group is the uh, uh, border driven deep learning. As I said, and the communication has, theory and system has been developed for about uh, 70 years. There are not so theories and, uh, and uh, methods to do that. And then another way, we can use the deep learning 
together with the communication knowledge to improve the performance of the communication systems. Those are kind of the approach are generally called a model driven deep learning for physical layer communications. And uh, back to several years ago, we have a, a survey paper. If you are interested, you can see. Inside of those uh, deep, uh, model driven deep learning, there is a not one of the important group is the deep unfolding. And this method basically uh, unwrap an iterative approach and then add some trainable parameters to improve the performance of communication systems. And one of the application example, you can use that for the MIMO detection. And uh, we know that. And uh, sometimes the MIMO detection complexity is very high, especially if the transmitted symbols are transmitted a symbol vector X in this uh, formula are very large. And uh, the, the complexity is exponential proportional to the number of the transmitted symbols. So if we are trying to use the optimal method, such as MAP or ML, the uh, detection performance, detection complexity is very high. So there is some, uh, there is some uh, like uh, simplified method. For example, linear detector, we can use zero forcing, uh, linear minimum mean square error approach. Those algorithms are with no complexity, but their performance are pretty poor. So there are some algorithms in between them, which are iterative detectors. And uh, for example, we can develop uh, iterative detectors based on AMP method. And also we can do that based on the EP method. And uh, because these are kind of the iterative approach, you are trying to combine machine learning with those uh, method to develop uh, a deeper unfolding method, the performance and can be significantly improved. And due to the time limit, uh, I don't think I have time to talk more about it. Then there is another way, as I said, something called end-to-end -to -end, uh, wireless communications. And uh, for this method, and uh, we have a uh, new network to represent a transmitter, another way to represent a receiver. And uh, there are two ways to design them. And one way, the, the, one of the critical issues is the, the training of the neural network is very hard uh, because of the complexity of the channel and because of the perhaps the, uh, the size of the transmitted symbol. And for example, there is one, one of the way to do that is put the uh, uh, transmitted neural network in the context of the uh, of the uh, reinforcement learning, and we regarded the transmitter neural network as the policy of the agent. And we're trying to optimize the, age, the, the policy of the agent. And when the policy is optimized, the uh, transmitter neural network is optimized. I'm not going to talk about the detail due to the time. And for detail, you can take a look at the paper by Arcodia and Hoyles. Another way is what we have developed and uh, to address the unknown channel when we transmit, when we train in transmitting neural network and the receiver neural network, we can use the uh, uh, GAN as a, to express a channel. In that case, we have three network, neural networks in tandem, which is easy for us uh, to uh, perform the, uh, the training. So this is the performance. Let's talk a little bit about the semantic communication. And uh, well, I just talk about the basic principle. And if you want to transmit the, uh, the, the, the uh, English word, for example, there are several ways we can encode this English word letter by letter. In that case, using this calculation, we need 27.5 uh, bits per word. And if we encode the dictionary, and which is about uh, 171,000 English words from Google, then we, we need the 18 bits. And uh, compared with the uh, 27.5, the, the, the complexity is significantly uh, reduced. 
And then you will encode English is semantically. For example, you will talk, we are we have a conversation, we are talking about, we are answering a yes or no question. Then we will get a uh, one bit information. And uh, but we transmit the the conversation, the required transmit bits is very normal. Based on that discussion, we can see semantic communication can significantly improve the performance of the transmission efficiency. And uh, for example, if we want to transmit image in the human body, but we only care about the, the structure of the, 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 the hand, then we only care, we only transmit uh, the information we are interested in, ignore the other information. That's a critical, uh, critical idea of the semantic communication. The implementation of the semantic communication so far, we can only use a neural network to deal with that. Basically at the transmitter, we have a background analogy, which is this the same background, background analogy is shared by the receiver. And with background analogy, and we can do semantic encoding based on a neural network. And then we can use another neural network to, to do channel encoding. At the receiver, we do things in reverse. And uh, then we hope in that, that case, situation, we can transmit a, a semantic meaning. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the detail due to the time. And uh, in brief, to uh, develop a semantic encoder, we and the channel encoder, we have to use some tool, uh, which is called a transformer. And for detail regarding the transformer, you can take a look at this paper. For details regarding the semantic communication, you can take a look at this paper. This is perhaps one of the first uh, semantic communication papers. Well, the training of the neural network is not a trivial. We have to carefully design the North function and to consider both the performance of training and consider its uh, easiness of the implementation. And uh, basically the training is divided into two steps. And another one is the performance metric. And because this is a new area, there is no already uh, performance metric like in the traditional communication systems. We can use BER, block aggregator, or, or mean square error. But for the semantic communication, there is no uh, a simple metric to do. And uh, so we proposed this performance metric and, uh, and we also performed a computer simulation, which demonstrated the efficiency of the semantic communications. And I think, I think uh, my time is up. That's all for my, my talk. And uh, for the conclusion, I talked about the conventional communication and end-to-end -end communications based on the uh, uh, deep learning. And also I briefly talked about the semantic communications. And that's all for today. Uh, thanks for, for listening to my talk. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yili. Um, a very dense presentation. Um, I recommend uh, whoever has more um, uh, questions to contact uh, Professor Yili. I don't see, um, uh, no, actually I see one question. Um, that's, uh, uh, the question is, how can we measure the semantic similarity on non-text forms of signals, for example, images or videos? Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's actually an interesting question. Uh, uh, in this example, this, in, this, uh, in this paper, we're talking about uh, transmission of the uh, text. And then we use the, uh, this is a traditional way. To, to measure the similarity of the two words, which is a below score. And in addition to that, I will propose a, a new one to measure, especially proposed to measure the sentence, which is called a sentence similarity. similarity. And this, this is, those are two sentences, S hat and S. And their, their similarity is defined as this formula. And here, B phi S is called something called a, uh, steer masses network. And, uh, but if uh, we're talking about the image, the metric will be totally different. And uh, of course, for the image, you cannot use uh, mean square error. 
And uh, there, there is another way to measure the quantity. And usually uh, people use measure the, the image quality using a subjective test. Just uh, you, you, you have image, you let the different people to look at that. Ask them to justify whether this image is good or not. And uh, you, you can do the test and the best of the test result, you can uh, like uh, construct a neural network and then use the neural network to justify uh, the quality of the image. Or you can even uh, read the people's the, 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 the brand's reaction, use the brand's reaction signal to do that. And uh, the, this, uh, the last one is what we are trying to do. When we recently have a paper in signal processing nature to tell us how to use the, 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 the brain currents to, to, to justify the quantity of image. Thank you very much. Um, um, we are running out of time, so we should pass to the next speaker. Um, thank you again, Professor Yili. Uh, now, the next speaker should have been Luis Neves from JC. Uh, but as far as I know, we don't have him online. Uh, but uh, Giuseppe Caire from TU Berlin has uh, nicely agreed to go next. So we will focus on pilot decontamination and user scheduling in self-free user-centric networks. Giuseppe, the floor is yours. Okay, oopsie. So okay. We can hear, we can see you. Yes. And uh... yes. Um, let me uh, share my screen. I think that I can share my screen. Yes, you can. We okay. can see it. We can see then it I... not in slide uh, in presentation mode. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. This should be okay, Perfecto. right? Perfecto. Thank you okay. very much. Very good. Okay. So in this. Uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, some recent results on uh, self-free use and centering network and uh, a little bit of a perspective of uh, what uh, this network uh, may become uh, going uh, then uh, much higher in frequency. So, uh, well, we know what the uh, 6G, uh, you know, is about uh, more or less. Uh, a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, high frequencies, but there is also emphasis on beyond cellular and uh, integrated sensing and communication. And in this um, presentation, I will focus on beyond cellular, in particular, cell-free massive MIMO. Uh, for the whole presentation, I will focus on uh, more conventional frequencies where uh, the uh, problem is that in order to meet, uh, you know, 5G, uh, 6G requirements uh, in those frequencies, uh, the bandwidth is not uh, so um, widely available, and therefore we need to shoot for extremely high spectral efficiencies. So I'm talking about spectral efficiencies of well beyond 50 bit per second per hertz every. 10 by 10 meters square. So imagine a situation of a soccer stadium uh, where in 10 meters square, you have uh, easily 100 people and they all want to communicate. You immediately see that uh, this uh, is a very challenging problem. Uh, so just to give a sort of historical perspective, the idea of joint processing of all uh, radio heads or uh, you know transmitter infrastructure antennas is extremely uh, you know well known in at least in theory it dates back to an old paper by our own Weiner in 1994 uh, who computed the uh, Shannon capacity of the uplink of a cellular system assuming that one can process all and uh, antennas a, 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 in a centralized way. Uh, there has been some um, attempt in the past, so-called coordinated multipoint uh, or distributed antenna systems, and uh, with not so 
lucky, I would say, because essentially, not, not because uh, the idea is stupid, but uh, because the standards were not designed to handle this type of processing. And of course, more modernly, in uh, especially 5G enables uh, uh, this type of uh, joint processing. So we have the so-called centralized RAN and the virtualization of the physical layer, et cetera, et cetera. However, this uh, is still at the level of cluster. So there is, you know, it's just you change the concept of cell, you make it a, a, a distributed antenna a cluster, and there is still intercluster interference. So let me also talk about uh, a little bit about the principles of massive MIMO. So why massive MIMO is such a good idea? Well, first of all, it has to work in TDD, uh, and it uses uh, uh, uplink downlink channel reciprocity. Uh, now, it used to be a difficult problem. Now, reciprocal radios are, are, are easy to produce. You find the prototypes, you find products that are reciprocal. So basically, the idea is that one can estimate the, the channels, both in uplink and downlink, from pilots sent by the users, which means in the uplink, which means that there is no need to probe the channel in the downlink which means that a single pilot uh, can train an unlimited number of antennas in the uplink. And these enormous la la enormously large number of antennas uh, uh, can be used uh, to make uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, clever signal processing. Of course, these requires a certain uh, 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 coherence block. Uh, so the product of coherence bandwidth and coherence time cannot be too short. Otherwise, there is no time to fit uh, uh, uplink, downlink, and piloting in the same block. Um, so information theory tells us that uh, if we do a cassette bound and uh, put all the users on one side, all the antennas on the other side, and the channel stays constant for T time frequency symbols, well, the optimal highest SNR uh, capacity goes in this way. So it goes like log SNR, which is the classical Gaussian channel capacity, multiplied by this factor, which is the spatial multiplexing gain. And this M star is the minimum between number of antennas, number of users, and half of the coherence block. So we see that if we blow up the number of antennas and the number of users, the minimum becomes half of the coherence block, which is essentially, if you count a coherence block like a resource block, it's about 200 symbols. So 200 symbols divided by two is, uh, is 100. So uh, you know it's easy to have a system with more than 100 antennas and 100 users. So basically, what happens is that if we maximize this with a, a, for large number of antennas, large number of users, uh, the, the, the best uh, pre-log factor is t over four. t over four uh, uh, obtained for m star equal to uh, t half, which means basically that you have to, the best use of your channel is to train for half of the time or half of the block. So when I hear people that say, oh, you know, pilot redundancy, pilot redundancy, Pilot, the best pilot redundancy is 50%. And, uh, and this gives a T over four multiplexing gain, which means uh, basically, again, about 50. So 50 times log SNR, if we can support the highest SNR with, uh, you know, uh, three, four, five bit per second per hertz times 50, we clearly get very close to, you know, hundreds of uh, uh, bit per second per hertz which is a, 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 an enormous spectral efficiency. So why we need a very large number of antennas? Well, we need a large number of antennas because uh, uh, everything else becomes simple. Um, we, we know that uh, uh, you know, the, the channel, the fading channel uh, hardens. So scheduling, rate adaptation, IRQ and uh, adaptive uh, is, is not needed anymore. Everything becomes much, much, much simpler. Um, Okay, so next step is to go to distributed uh, antennas. And uh, so take the, uh, unpack the massive MIMO and just distribute the antennas everywhere. And this is the self-free idea. Just to give you an, uh, an idea, there is a, a, a startup uh, from the Bay Area uh, called Artemis Networks that have run some experiments 
in a system with uh, 20 megahertz of bandwidth uh, using uh, 5G com uh, compliant uh, radios. Uh, and they uh, ran this in a, in a uh, um, basket, so sport arena. Uh, and this arena is uh, also uh, equipped with a state-of-the-art Wi-Fi 6 and uh, state-of-the-art LTE distributed antenna systems. And uh, they have used uh, 400 phones simultaneously active, distributed around the, 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 the stadium, and they have measured the, the throughput. Uh, this is measured throughput with all the products, no simulation. And these are the results. And the reason for these results is that basically all standard systems still try to form a sort of cellular, so try to uniquely associate the users to antennas, while a full joint processing at the physical layer uh, gives, uh, you know, just uh, basically no more unique association, no more cells, and it is much better. So, okay, this is uh, just to say that these things are not only happening in, on paper, they are happening right now in the reality. Um, so basically, uh, more on a theoretical level, we see this uh, um, cell-free system as a system where a large number of radio units, uh, that each one equipped with multiple antennas, is deployed. Uh, they implement the low level physical layer. So essentially demodulation, channel estimation, uh, FFTs uh, and combining. And then they communicate to uh, 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 so-called distributed uh, units or uh, uh, the, the DUs that uh, implement uh, the rest of the physical layer through a um, say a data network, which uh, could be like a, a, a packet switching network. Um, and the idea is to design systems that are scalable. Scalable means that it's not like concentrating all the signals in a single point, because otherwise at some point there will be clusters and there will be cluster boundaries. The idea is that uh, we have a certain density of user, a certain density of RUs, and a certain density of DUs. And given those densities, we can just uh, extend the system, you know, also in principles, blanket a whole city uh, in this way, uh, and such that the computation and the traffic on uh, at every point of the network remain finite while the area of the network at constant density of devices increases. Huh? So then this is a concept of scalability. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of interesting questions. So how to form this user-centric cluster in order you cannot have uh, a, a, um, you know, a single processor that process all the users. So we will have Every user has a user-centric cluster that is allocated to some DU. So we have a problems of allocating these uh, sort of virtualized network functions that are the cluster processors to the DUs in order to uh, achieve a certain load balancing and computation load balancing. Um, and uh, a good news, first good news is that uh, such networks will be extremely power efficient. And here is the reason. Um, when you look at uh, the antenna gain, suppose we have a number of antennas, which is equal to number of radio units L times number of antenna per radio units N. So given a total number of antennas given by this product, is it better to concentrate them and use antenna gain or distribute them and fight the path loss because the distance between a transmitter and receiver will be less. And it turns out that uh, we can make this calculation. The antenna gain is uh, proportional to the number of antennas. The path loss is uh, proportional to an inverse power of the distance. 
Now, if we consider a certain area with a certain number of, uh, of um, um, radio units, so a certain density lambda sub a of radio units, it turns out that by doing all the substitution and, and looking at this product, we see that this term is fixed, is a total density of antennas per unit area. And this term, actually because nu, the path loss exponent is typically larger than two, this is um, a, a, a lambda sub a, is density of radio unit raised to a positive exponent. So increasing the density of radio units will increase this product, which means that makes the network more energy efficient, uh, which means also that uh, uh, it is in fact convenient to distribute the antennas. Um, okay, so there is a, like a right balance between how we distribute uh, because of, you know, single antenna radio units are, may, there is also to, 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 to be taken into account that, uh, you know, is where you do the processing. So there is like a magic number, maybe, I don't know, eight, 16 antennas per radio unit. And, uh, and then uh, you place them, which is not very different from today's Wi-Fi routers that have about between eight and 16 antennas, the, the last generation. So here, the, the major difference is really in how you do the processing. So we have a system with uh, users, antenna, so radio units, and uh, we have a, this assignment for which for every user, we have a cluster, a user-centric cluster of serving radio units. And for every radio units, uh, there is a set of users that are served by that radio unit. So we have this bipartite graph. And this bipartite graph, because of the piloting, uh, the users send uplink pilots and uh, only the radio units that uh, know that are associated to the user can, can actually decode them basically gives like a partial view of the of the of the of the system so uh, we have a, a channel matrix that uh, where we have a channel vector connecting every user to every radio unit but in fact a given cluster processor is uh, will see only the channels that it can estimate and the other one it treats them as zero uh, so it means that there will be some interference that cannot be resolved because simply uh, uh, these channels are unknown. Uh, so what we did uh, is uh, to consider a system that uh, is able to fight the so-called pilot contamination. The pilot contamination is that if I have two users using the same pilot, well, that radio unit will estimate a superposition of the channels. And this is a well-known problem in massive MIMO and also in cell-free massive MIMO, that uh, if you have users that uh, uh, share the same pilot and the pilot dimension is small with respect to the number of users, uh, uh, we, we, we will have this contamination and therefore a, a precoding will not be uh, uh, efficient enough. So how do we uh, fight pilot contamination? Well, first of all, uh, propagation, especially when, when the distance between transmitter and receiver is small, is quite directional, uh, which means that a radio unit, maybe uh, you have one every 10 meters and it, it sees the, 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 the signal coming from, you know, some maybe line of sight or semi line of sight plus some, some multipath, but there is some correlation in space. So if we can learn the subspace that uh, contains the user channels, so essentially we learn the covariance of these user channels, then we can apply uh, uh, decontamination because even if say two users share the same pilot, but they come from different angles, they can be separated in, uh, uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, because the subspaces of the two channels are uh, quasi orthogonal. So the problem is how do we learn the subspaces? So first of all, I will uh, we, we, we will learn this. So basically we, we consider two types of pilots. There are the so-called DMRS pilots. So it's the modulation reference signal. There are the classical pilots that are sent by every user on every resource block. 
And then there is the SR, uh, uh, SRS pilots, sounding reference signals. Those, uh, we design them using hopping sequences uh, that hop over the whole system bandwidth and use uh, a scheme called the latent square, such that the interference is um, uh, average. Uh, you have a sort of statistical average of interference. In fact, without going into further detail, so we use orthogonal Latin squares. On an orthogonal Latin square, you have a hopping sequence, for example, the sequence one that hops, these are times, these are frequencies, it hops in this way, collides with all different users in uh, another uh, in an adjacent uh, region. So you have this uh, statistical interference averaging and uh, the pilot, these Latin square sequences are uh, allocated geographically. So they are not allocated per radio unit, but every user given its position will pick one uh, sequence out of the Latin square corresponding to the, its area. So this creates a sort of the observation or this pilot observation at a given radio unit contains the wanted channel and then interference term. These are the co-pilot channels hopping in the, in the same time frequency slot plus noise. And it turns out that because of these uh, statistical averaging due to these uh, Latin squares, only a few strong interferers will appear here. So in a sequence of N pilot symbols, this will be a, uh, this uh, observation will be affected by strong interference only in a few symbols. So it turns out that uh, uh, the problem of estimating the subspace of a, a series of samples affected by a sparse strong interferers can be obtained. Normally you would do a so-called principal component analysis, which consists of uh, constructing a sample covariance matrix and doing the SVD. But there is an algorithms that are called robust principal component analysis that are able to essentially extract and eliminate these strong outliers which is exactly what we create with these uh, uh, special uh, hopping patterns. So it turns out that uh, the combination of the hopping patterns with the robust PCA gives an extremely efficient way to estimate the, these uh, uh, channel subspaces. And what we have here, so that's uh, just uh, some performances, but what we have here are, uh, this is the CDF, of uh, uplink and downlink rates uh, for a uh, system that uh, where we assume that the channel state information is perfectly known, and then systems where we uh, use our method to uh, estimate uh, the covariances and decontaminate the, the, uh, the pilot, and therefore this is for real uh, uh, estimated channels. And you can see that uh, the uh, performance is almost coincide. So basically we achieve almost ideal uh, CSI performance. Also interestingly is uh, the level of spectral efficiencies. This is total spectral efficiencies in bit per second per hertz in an area. This is a, a system with the 25 radio units, 16 antennas per radio unit. And um, uh, on a square of 100 by 100 meters. So it's kind of uh, similar to this soccer stadium or this, uh, this the sports arena that we have seen before. And as we move up with the number of users, we see that the spectral efficiency up to, I would say between 300 and 400 uh, bit per second per hertz can be, can be uh, achieved. And this is uh, already pretty good. Um, um, excuse me, Giuseppe, uh, we need uh, to come to the end. Yes. A couple of minutes, thank you. Yes, so uh, I want just to, to conclude by saying that, uh, um, okay, I will, well, I will just mention that one can also do scheduling and achieve some form of fairness. It's not only uh, user, say, rates, but we can also enforce some form of fairness. 
let me just conclude by saying what uh, uh, what happens with these uh, architectures when we go to high frequencies. Uh, when in high frequencies, what happens is that uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, all this basement processing and this precoding algorithm that I talked about becomes essentially in, uh, infeasible. Uh, we have been forming antennas that will work in the in the RF domain. And so on the other hand, the channels are much more sparse. And in addition, when uh, we have enough been forming, this increases the, the sparsity of the scattering because basically you eliminate a lot of multipath by, by, uh, by, by beam forming to the target. So essentially what we can see is that uh, this kind of network will be useful uh, in uh, the regime of the say millimeter waves and, and subterrors because we can use user centric clusters to be informed to users on multiple directions. And the main problem with this, uh, with these frequencies is the lack of line of sight. So by using this sort of macro diversity, uh, uh, one can uh, uh, basically be robust to blocking. And, uh, and a very interesting problem is uh, what would be a good uh, uh, waveform, uh, uh, good signaling that allows the receiver to combine the beam form signals from multiple direction that will come, of course, with the slightly different uh, delays and phases that uh, have to be compensated. So one has to do some form of combining here which of course, when you have a, a 10 gigahertz of bandwidth becomes a, a, a problematic. So this is a challenge. And, um, and with this uh, last consideration, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Um, sorry to hurry up, but we have a tight agenda. Um, I recommend once again to the to the participants um, to contact Giuseppe if they have any specific question. The slides will be made available, and the discussion should go on at any time, even offline. And now we have um, Luis Neves that, meanwhile, um, has arrived. So uh, thank you, Luis, for coming. Um, Luis Neves is the CEO of the Global Enabling Sustainability Initiative, and we will hear more from him about digital with purpose. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Luis. Well, thank you so much. And uh, first of all, my apologies because there was some confusion about my my entry time, uh, but I hope that um, I will still be in a position to let us to let you know what we, we are doing. I guess I can share my screen, my my screen with my slides. Uh, so, well, first of all, um, a few words about Jesse. Um, uh, Jesse is a, uh, an industry association that brings together uh, digital companies or companies in the digital world, and we have been working um, around what I call the intersection between um, technology and sustainable development for over 20 years now. So we are probably one of the most resourceful organization in the world when it comes to understanding the impact of digital technologies uh, when it comes to the sustainable development goals. And we need to think about uh, a very simple thing that the world today already as 8 billion people, we just crossed the 8 billion people number. Uh, in, within the next 10 years, 12 years, we'll be 9 billion. And before 2050, the world will have around 10 billion people. And we all know that today the world, uh, the resources that we have uh, are not enough to sustain the current population. So we consume the yearly resources of the world around the middle of the year. So the other six months of the year, we are living above the capacity of the planet. And this cannot continue. We are already <laughs> facing challenges. We already understand the, the climate impacts, but there, there are many other impacts. So, so Jesse is very much about you know, delivering um, and foster digital innovation in a responsible uh, manner to transform our world for good. Um, so uh, you'll see from my presentation that it will be very, very different from the previous uh, one that uh, I had the pleasure also to see. Uh, we are very much looking to 
a different angle. And these are our members. I'll not spend very much time on this. So as you can see, very many big companies, including Huawei. Uh, these are our partners. What makes us difference from almost every single industry association is that we work in an open way uh, with universities, with the United Nations agencies. So we, we have three United Nations partners, the ITU, which probably is very well done to you, the UNFCCC, which is the organization from the United Nations that is uh, now organizing the climate summit in Egypt. Uh, and we also have uh, relationships with UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program, which deals more with the environmental side. But we also have in our organization other business associations as partners, like the International Chamber of Commerce um, and many others. And we work also with the non-for-profit organizations that bring value to the work that we are doing. Uh, so very diverse, very open organization. Uh, our vision is that for us to achieve what we need to do, we need to work in cooperation with many others. And so I just spoke about the situation of the world and this um, chart gives you an overview where the world is right now. This is coming from our report that was done for us by Accenture Strategy in 2017. We made an analysis uh, about the situation of the world in relation to the 17 sustainable development goals from the United Nations. And as you can see, the world is in very bad shape. So the poverty situation is very bad. Uh, we still have many people with uh, uh, food problems uh, when it comes to education, uh, to um, health and well-being gender equality, clean water. So as you can see, all the all the areas are in very bad shape. And, and so uh, we need to do something. And we do think that uh, digital technologies can be part of the solution for the problems that we are facing. So in, in our report that I already mentioned to you, uh, our analysis and the, the central analysis is that connectivity and the digital solutions are fundamental to meet the SDG, so the Sustainable Development Goals for 8.5 billion people, which was the number of people that we were looking at uh, around 2030. And so all, all these solutions for food and housing, so smart agriculture, smart building, um, e-government, smart police, real-time disaster warnings, e-banking, e-commerce, e-work, connectivity, smart energy. So all of these technologies will be fundamental to bring the, the world on track. And, uh, and therefore, it is important that uh, our scientists, our engineers, once they develop new solutions, when they think about new technologies like 6G, uh, they also think about how those technologies can provide more efficiency and can contribute to a better world. Um, we have been working on, 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 as I said, from the very beginning um, in, in this area of sustainable development in tech. And uh, recently in 2019 uh, with Deloitte, we did a very deep analysis, uh, much deeper than the previous one that I mentioned to you, uh, whereby we looked into seven disruptive technologies from digital access, internet, cloud, IoT, cognitive, virtual reality and blockchain. And we correlated these seven disruptive technologies uh, with the, one of the 69 SDG targets, the sustainable development uh, goal targets. And we came to the conclusion that digital technologies was impacting uh, 103 of, of them. Uh, and uh, this is the approach that we undertook, as you can see from the analysis of the 17 SDGs and 169 targets. We divided them uh, around three clusters, which was the planet, the societal impact, and the uh, environmental impact. Uh, we then already mentioned technologies. We looked to four impact functions. And then we analyzed over 500 case studies or use cases to understand how technology or how those seven disruptive technologies were impacting the sustainable development in the different areas. So we looked at the quality, we made qualitative assessments and we also made quantitative assessments. 
uh, of the technologies, we also look at the impact of uh, the ICT sector footprint uh, that has been uh, very much criticized right now. So many people uh, consider that our industry is part of the problem for climate change. And uh, therefore, we wanted to understand really what does that mean deploying more technology? What is the impact? How digital technologies are how much are polluting the planet? Understand what are the key areas uh, that are contributing to pollution? And of course, we identify two of them. One is electronic waste. As we produce more and more materials, we are not recycling uh, in a, an appropriate manner those materials. So we need to pay more attention to circular economy. And of course, we need to look into the greenhouse gas emissions that uh, that are coming from the, the network infrastructure and from the from the development of all these devices. So this is the way that we um, identify the 103 target. So as you can see, we look to the 169. We have deprioritized those targets that are influenced by policy and aid. And then we also deprioritize targets where ICT at low, almost insignificant importance to come to the 103 targets that, that I mentioned to you. And here you can see that, um, and these are only three examples. So we looked into the SDG9, industry, innovation, and uh, infrastructure. Uh, as you can see, there is a positive impact in 2030. We looked into gender equality. So technology is impacting in a positive manner. Uh, gender equality, and we also look to, to the clean water and sanitation. Uh, here you can see also that uh, you know the as you deploy digital technologies, you can impact in a positive manner. Also, water consumption. Uh, again, uh, inequalities, life in on land, and quality of education. So we looked into all the SDGs, and into all of them, we could see. A positive impact once you deploy digital technologies. So in summary, um, we came to the conclusion that digital technologies can impact 22% of the SDGs and uh, mitigate the downward trend of 23% of them. They have an incredible economic impact. Um, and, uh, and in general, digital technologies will contribute to a better sustainable development. And the more we invest, the more we'll be seeing the impact of that. But we also need to understand that the planet is under threat from rising carbon emissions, that our society sees persistent inequality and lack of access to basic services. And we see that the more we develop new technologies, artificial intelligence, uh, you see that most of, of those solutions, these new innovations, there is a, a significant concentration in big corporations, and that is leading to more inequality as well. Um, our economy continues to drive unsustainable consumption, um, and we also uh, identify that over 30% of the indicators are deteriorating uh, and could undermine uh, or be undermined by climate change. So there is a need to take action um, and action needs to be undertaken thinking about the future, uh, the planet where we will be living. Uh, that means that uh, we need to focus on solutions that can deliver a new generation of innovations using digitalization in the fourth industrial revolution and moving from the static problem innovation approach to a dynamic opportunity innovation approach. That means new ways of delivering what is needed. So when we think about new technologies, when we think about new developments, we need to focus on those solutions that people will need in the future. Those solutions that really keep the world on track, those solutions that really provide for um, an appropriate sustainable planet. And, and therefore, the GSE agenda is very much about delivering what human or humans need. And we think that we should focus in three key areas. Uh, of course, uh, one of the areas is uh, very much around governance. We, we need to have a, a, an appropriate governance. But the three areas where we need to focus, it will be around smart buildings and the dematerialization 
Uh, so what we call the spaces protection areas very much around smart city planning. Uh, so whereby you need to think cities in, in a different manner with more walkability, green spaces, and, and so on. Then you need an area around nutrition and health. So we, we need to think more closely about what we need and how that impacts in, in, in a positive manner our health. So smart nutrition, smart meals, health tracking, preventive, preventive health care. Uh, so this is healthy um, lifestyles, uh, both physical and mental, of course. And then the third area, which is a fundamental area as well, it's about social development and personal grow growth. It's about lifelong learning, uh, empowering individuals and groups. Think about tailor-made education or M education, um, and so focusing on on, on education. So this is an agenda that we need to pursue. And for that, we need digital to have a purpose. And that's why in GSC, uh, using our digital with purpose report with Deloitte, we decided to start and invite the companies to join on a purpose-driven agenda. Uh, and the, the journey starts by the companies committing to a pledge with four points which are the committing to the supporting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, take and report concrete action on climate change in line with the Paris Agreement, embrace the principles of impact transparency, and report yearly and develop and deploy digital technology with social positive impact. So the movement, uh, you know, to make the movement um, more uh, accountable, we develop the set of metrics uh, and the, the metrics are very much around the purpose. So all companies align uh, sustainable development with, with business. Uh, there is a need for companies to rethink the way that they operate, not, not only thinking about, you know, big profitability. It's important, well, profitability is important because it ensures jobs, but companies are part of the ecosystem. They are part of the society and they need to contribute to the society in a different manner, thinking about what is the company role in terms of ensuring the sustainability of the planet as well. And for that, it's important that companies realign from top down its purpose, that they think about in every single area of the company, from marketing to procurement to sales, uh, you know, any area of the company, the companies need to think uh, sustainable, and, and by the way, sustainable uh, is connected with profitability because all the Jesse reports uh, point on that direction. Our report from 2015 calculated the value of equivalent to the GDP of China in terms of profitability derived from sustainability. Then the secondary is around deploying solutions, those solutions for people's needs that I already mentioned. And of course, the third area is about companies walking the talk Companies need to resolve their own internal problems around climate change, so becoming more energy efficient. They need to think about the ethical value of, of digital technologies. So digital trust and responsibility is a very important area. Deploy a circular economy strategy. There is no single company in the world that has a circular economy strategy. Uh, digital inclusion is a very important area. So the contribution of companies to, to make the world more inclusive uh, and then supply chain impacts. This is an area very important because uh, the scope three emissions that are coming from the supply chain are the most difficult um, um, CO2 emissions to calculate and also to, to reduce. So we develop metrics in all these areas for the companies to, to respond. We developed the certification scheme to award the companies uh, with four levels. Um, and the, the companies, when they respond to the metrics, the metrics will be verified. And then depending on the company performance, they will get the recognition um, through the, the, the stamp, the digital purpose stamp that has four levels, as I mentioned to you. So to conclude, it's important that we think about technology, but technology is about people, is about making people's lives better. Uh, and, and therefore, um, I hope that 
when we think about technology, when we think about new developments, when we think about 6G, uh, all those of you with with an incredible capacity, intelligence to develop those innovations, you also think about sustainable development and all those innovations will impact the world for better. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. I think it was a very inspiring presentation. And I think it's also nice to conclude um, uh, the, the day, uh, even where I'm close to the conclusion, but after several technical presentation with your uh, overview on the digital uh, purpose, uh, digital with purpose initiative, uh, because indeed technology is a mean, is a mean to uh, make sure that uh, our society, our economy, our environment uh, can uh, develop in a sustainable way. Uh, 6G uh, can help in that direction, of course, greening technologies to green the environment is the next big challenge for all the technologists. Um, thank you very much, Luis. Thank you.